8pm in Japan. Welcome to Newsroom Tokyo. I'm Hideki Nakayama. And I'm Aki Shibuya. Let's start with the headlines. Donald Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital has provoked criticism and protests across the Islamic world. A senior UN official has met with North Korea's foreign minister in Pyongyang. Japanese fishermen are dealing with an influx of North Koreans fishing illegally in the Sea of Japan. Trade ministers are preparing to resume negotiations at the WTO. The conference chair tells us why the organization is still needed. On today's Focus, what would life be like if everyone received a regular sum of money every month with no strings attached? It's called basic income, and a number of countries are testing it out. It's been condemned and criticized. And now protests continue across the Arab world after the U.S. president recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The decision alters decades of American policy, one some say could threaten the peace process in the region. <laughs> Protesters in the West Bank are taking part in what Palestinian groups have called three days of rage. We're asking the Palestinian Authority and the President Mahmoud Abbas to stop all the peace negotiations with the Israelis. U.S. officials have cautioned Americans in the Middle East and Europe about possible unrest. Trump says he'll also follow through on a campaign pledge to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The city is home to sites that are holy to the Jewish, Muslim and Christian religions. Israel has long claimed Jerusalem as its capital, but the claim is not recognized by the international community. Palestinians see East Jerusalem as the capital of their future state. Trump said the specifics of Jerusalem's borders should be negotiated and indicated he'd be prepared to support a two-state solution if both sides agree on it. Trump's decision was welcomed by Israel's prime minister. Benjamin Netanyahu says other countries may follow his lead, but for now, he appears to be standing alone. In a televised speech, the Palestinian president accused Trump of abdicating the U.S.'s role as a peace mediator. Meanwhile, the Turkish president says Trump's decision is akin to throwing the region into a ring of fire. U.S. ally Saudi Arabia is calling on Trump to review his decision. And the leader of the country with the world's largest Muslim population is doing the same. This decision has breached various Security Council resolutions and the General Assembly of the United Nations in which the U.S. is a permanent member. This decision can disturb world peace. Japan's foreign minister says his country is closely watching developments. We are concerned that President Trump's announcement could increase difficulties in Middle East peace talks or lead to the deterioration of the situation in the entire region. Members of the UN Security Council will meet on Friday to discuss it. The Arab League is also planning an emergency meeting on the weekend. A senior UN official on a rare visit to North Korea has met with the country's foreign minister amid increasing tension over the Korean peninsula. Jeffrey Feltman is reportedly in Pyongyang to urge the North to rein in its nuclear and missile development. The only thing the UN has said about this trip is that Feltman will discuss issues of mutual interest and concern. He is not expected to meet with leader Kim Jong-un. It's the first time a UN political chief has visited the country in more than seven years. It appears North Korea's foreign minister, Ri Yong-ho, reiterated his country's stance that the nuclear and missile programs are for their self-defense. Ri made news this past September when he slammed U.S. President Donald Trump's address to the UN General Assembly. He then suggested his country was considering testing a hydrogen bomb in the Pacific Ocean as a response. An increasing number of North Korean boats are fishing illegally in the Sea of Japan. And as winter approaches, the rough waters are making it difficult for them to stay afloat. On Thursday, another boat along with two bodies washed ashore in northern Japan. 
NHK World's Hiroyoshi Tanaka looks at what is driving this concerning trend. These North Korean fishing operations are small and simple. The boats are wooden with little technology on board. They hang their catches to dry. It's become a common sight in one of Japan's richest fishing grounds. The country's state-run media says more fish are needed for the sake of the revolution. The North Korean presence is causing concern for Japanese fishermen. The Japan Coast Guard has warned nearly 800 North Korean boats to leave the area. The effort to push North Korean vessels away from our waters is just a stopgap measure. As soon as the Coast Guard leaves, they come back again and again. This Japanese fisherman says it's a complicated situation. I hate them for ruining our business, but at the same time, I feel sorry for them because they have to go fishing no matter what. The weather in the Sea of Japan is especially bad around this time of year. Pyongyang relies on these fishermen as they continue to defy economic pressure to curb their nuclear programs. So it's unclear when this trend will stop. Hiroyoshi Tanaka, NHK World, Kanazawa. in business with Yuko Fukushima. So we're talking about World Trade tonight. The World Trade Organization is having an important meeting, and I have an inside view on the event. Oh, the WTO. I know it's at the center of world economy, but honestly, um, I don't know much about the organization, what's happening right now. Yeah, well, it's not surprising that uh, you haven't kept up, Hideki. The WTO has faded from headlines in recent years. Its founding mission was to promote open and fair trade, but countries are now bypassing the world body and setting up regional and bilateral trade agreements instead. And that's leading many people to question the WTO's role. With that cloud hanging overhead, a top-level meeting kicks off in Buenos Aires, Argentina this weekend. Well, WTO ministers meet every two years to try and rekindle the Doha round of trade liberalization talks. They've been doing this since 2001 and have very little to show for it. At the last conference in 2015, delegates debated whether to even continue the negotiations. Well, a little earlier, I talked to Susana Malcora, former foreign minister of Argentina and the person chairing the meeting conference. I would say that this conference takes place in a very uh, different environment than prior ones. Uh, it is clear that the world and on some parts of the world have shifted towards a level of criticism towards trade and, and that has an impact on, on the, the, the mood in which we are starting off this conference. Uh, for me, what is at stake is the, 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 the system itself. Now, Minister, you just mentioned that the world has changed uh, compared to the previous meeting. And one change is that there are more bilateral and regional trade pacts in the world. What do you think of the situation and what do you think can be the role of the WTO in this uh, context? We all uh, need to commit to, to the system, we need to recommit to a stronger WTO, but we also need to have the flexibility to recognize that uh, in order to prove to the world, to prove to the citizens of the world that WTO remains relevant, uh, we come to Buenos Aires with the spirit of compromise to move forward the agenda items that we have before us.
there are protectionist movements arising in some countries, including the largest economy in the world, the United States. Now, where does WTO stand in this context, in this world situation? My sense is, and I have seen this in my own conversations with the representatives from the U.S. administration, they, at this point in time, what they are saying is that they recognize that there is a need for WTO. They might have some questions about certain adjustments to WTO, which are fair. Each one of us as member of the WTO have the right to, to think about possible improvements. My view is that we have to engage, we have to discuss with the, the Trump administration, and we have to see how we accommodate all the views with the objective, which to us is central, of a stronger WTO. And again, that's our intention. Is there any specific agenda that you think will be agreed on at the conference this time? The first one, the most basic one, is illegal fishing. And, and that is something that it looks like we might have an agreement around uh, what the implications are and what the rules should be applied for illegal fishing. The other aspect is related to, to subsidies at large, uh, over stock or, or, or affecting stock. And, and those questions are more complicated. There are more nuanced. And it looks like it's not very, very possible to arrive to a conclusion by this conference. Staying with trade, China is one of the main engines driving international commerce. It's often called the world's factory, but the country is chasing another title, global innovator. China topped the international ranks for patent application filings. In 2016, officials at the World Intellectual Property Organization say innovators in China filed 1.3 patent applications last year. 1.3 million uh, patent applications last year. That accounted for over 40 percent of the world total. The United States came next with more than 600,000, followed by Japan and South Korea. The UN officials say patent application filings are rising every year in China, highlighting a growing focus on research and development. I think that reflects the strategic approach adopted by the leadership to uh, innovation and the transformation of the economy uh, to a greater value addition. The officials say the data indicates China's growing awareness of intellectual property and hopefully the need to protect it. Sharp has made a comeback in the financial markets. That is, the Japanese electronics maker returned to the first section of the Tokyo Stock Exchange on Thursday after toiling through a 16-month demotion. <laughs> President and CEO Tai Jang Wu celebrated the return to the market's big league. August 2016 now seems to be a distant memory. That was when Sharp was demoted to the second section after posting an annual loss of $2.3 billion. The company's fortunes changed rapidly under a new owner, Taiwan's Honhai Precision Industry, or Foxconn. Sharp made an operating profit in the year through March 2017, its first in three years. That whiplash turnaround paved the way for a relisting on TSE's first section. The comeback will likely make it easier to raise capital, signaling that Sharp is back in the game. Executives look happy, but Sharp shareholders are done celebrating. The stocks fell more than 2% on its first day back on the first section. That follows last week's 10% jump in the Sharp uh, share price triggered when the TSE announced Sharp's promotion. Onto the overall Tokyo stock, the Nikkei rebounded 1.45% and recovered some losses from the plunge on Wednesday. Tech shares were in demand after a sell-off in recent years, but the rise was limited by profit-taking. And to the rest of the region in Australia, the index rose more than half a percent. Weak exports in October had little impact on stocks. And in India, the Sensex gained more than 1%. Uh, the central bank gave more details about government support for banks holding bad loans. Japanese companies may soon have a solution to the ongoing problem of workers putting in overly long hours. 
First a warning though, viewers nervous about surveillance technology may want to look away. Coming to a desk near you, yes, that's right, the Office Drone. It's programmed to go into action when the working day is done, emitting a cheery tune that signals it's time to go home. Resistance is futile. The onboard camera looks for people staying late and alerts human office monitors. An AI option is being considered that will automatically identify the overtime offenders. The drone navigates with the help of transmitters placed around the office. That means it can move in the dark and do double duty as night security guard. The service is the brainchild of three firms, security company Taisei, telecom giant NTT East, and drone venture Blue Innovation. They plan to start deploying drones early next year. A new type of machine has started working alongside humans. No, not drones this time. We're talking about collaborative robots or cobots for short. NHK World's Nahoko Yamada has been evaluating their progress. The auto industry led the way in using collaborative robots, but there are no cars on this production line. These workers are packing rice balls side by side with the robot. The human first checks the labels, then the robot picks up the rice balls and puts them in containers. The new hire is no bigger than a copying machine, and it seems to get on well with co-workers. Our staff were afraid the robot could take away their jobs, but now they work happily together. They even say hi to the robot in the morning. Robots used to be kept in cages. Safer technology means they can now work alongside humans. That's good news for the rice ball maker. The plant is running at 70% capacity because it can't find workers. Robots can help boost production. The push to develop collaborative robot is gaining momentum around the globe. More than 600 companies have set up booths at this international robot exhibition in Tokyo, and many are showcasing machines that are designed to operate alongside human workers. Released from their cages, robots are taking up new trades. Some are offering a steady hand. Come by. Others are chipping in with the housekeeping. Japanese companies are leading the way in developing collaborative robots. One of them is Funak. This modding arm is made of urethane to prevent injury to humans. It's also fitted with safety sensors. One touch and it stops moving. Safety isn't the only requirement. Cobots need to be easy to operate. Move left. I see. I will turn to the left. And they need to be flexible. This machine is being taught to move an object from one place to another. The first time it needs a guiding hand from a human. And the press of a button, after that, the Kabat can do the job on its own. The maker is targeting smaller companies who don't have the skills to program robots. Workers no longer need to undergo extra training to learn how to maneuver robots. We hope to increase the lineup of moves that can be easily taught to the robot. Nursing care is another field facing a chronic labor shortage. The market for collaborative robots is forecast to reach $3.3 billion in the next five years. Robots still have much room for improvement in achieving a high level of interaction with humans. We believe technology will evolve so that humans and robots can communicate with each other and work side by side like colleagues. Developers say this vision of the future is not something humans need to fear. They say Kabats want to be part of the team, and they're reaching out with a helping hand. Nahoko Yamada, NHK World, Tokyo. That's the best for this Thursday.
The idea that everyone should have a basic income is gathering attention around the world. A small guaranteed income supplied by the government without conditions would ensure that everyone has the money to meet their basic needs. As the income gap in advanced economies widens, providing basic income is being viewed as a way to boost employment and eliminate poverty. While no country is ready yet to adopt the program, Finland is leading the world in testing it. Finland is known for its enhanced welfare measures. At a church in the capital Helsinki, more than a thousand people, mostly jobless workers, were waiting to receive free food. For the last eight years, the country's unemployment rate has remained high at around 8 percent. Government officials are looking for a way to get people back to work. The Finnish government launched a drastic experiment in January. It started providing a basic income unconditionally to 2,000 unemployed people selected randomly for a period of two years. Mari Sadimba lives with her 11-year-old son. Last October, she was fired from her supermarket job. After that, she had been living on monthly unemployment benefits worth $700. I struggled to pay my son's educational expenses and electric bills. I felt insecure every day. But even then, Saramba says she wasn't eager to look for a job. If she got hired again, the amount of her unemployment benefits would have been reduced and her overall income would have hardly increased. Then a letter came from the government notifying her she had been chosen for the experimental basic income program. I work here now. With no conditions attached to her new basic income, Sarumba wanted to work again. She began working at a printing factory and also at a supermarket. She receives a monthly basic income of $600. This will not be reduced even if she has other sources of income. She can work as much as she wants. Including the pay from her two jobs, her monthly income has risen to about $2,000. <laughs> I think you're working a bit too much. But we are better off financially. I'm positive about working now. I feel relieved since I no longer have to feel uncertain about our finances. I hope to work full-time and become self-sustaining in the future. Joining us in the studio is NHK World Business News correspondent Hirotaka Toyonaga, who covers the story. So, Hirotaka, I'm um, looking at the, uh, your report. It looks like uh, the mother um, it had a great impact for having this basic income. Um, tell us about then the merits for the society as a whole. Okay, so as we saw in the video, one benefit is that the basic income system can motivate people on welfare to work. And some experts point out that the government will spend a lot less on the administrative costs and the basic income system because it's simple. Mm -hmm. So it actually costs a lot of money to pay uh, welfare and unemployment benefits uh, involving uh, complicated procedures and uh, including the screening of recipients. It also said that the, uh, another major benefit is that uh, people who need government support but aren't get it will also be helped. So what are some potential drawbacks of this system? In June last year, Switzerland held a referendum to ask the public whether the country should introduce a basic income program. More than 70 percent of voters were against the idea and the proposal was turned down. So there were two main reasons. So. One of the reasons cited was the belief that basic income may demo, demo, demotivate people to work. The other reason was the massive fiscal expense. So one Japanese expert calculated how much it, it would cost 
if the government adopted a universal basic income system, he estimates it would have to raise income taxes by roughly, roughly 20% mm. to pay everyone the equivalent of $600 per dollars a month. But I would like to add that the burden of this tax on each working person will be offset somewhat um, by receiving the basic income. The question is whether the public would agree to shoulder this heavier burden. Mm. Now, are other countries experimenting with this? Yes. The idea of uh, basic income is drawing uh, the attention of many people. Uh, this uh, this uh, map shows experiments are already going on in more than 10 countries and regions. So this shows that many people are seeing a need to improve the current social welfare system. And government officials are not the only ones who are interested in the, the basic income system. A number of business readers also see it as beneficial. Today, our jobs are gradually being taken over by AI and robots. No person is seen in this warehouse. Robots are taking out boxes as needed. At a restaurant, robots wash dishes. Technology to make AI read the news is being developed. Business leaders who have led the development of IT and AI are showing increasing interest in the introduction of basic income. We should explore ideas like universal basic income to make sure that everyone has a cushion to try new ideas. Not just by economic metrics like GDP, but by how many of us have a role we find meaningful. If you're not needed, if there's not a need for your labor, how do you, how, what's the meaning? I think we'll just end up doing uh, universal basic income. It's going to be necessary. Japanese entrepreneur Takafumi Horie is among those voicing the need for basic income. I think the system should be introduced throughout society, but there's been little progress in this discussion. So I thought I should show an example. Horie came up with his own experiment. He offered five volunteers who subscribe to his website $900 a month each. Yukihiro Ujiie is one of the lucky five. He quit his job six months ago. He has a great interest in meteorological observation. Since he has more free time, he can now concentrate on developing drones to use in his projects. He also started doing site surveys in Africa. Ujiye says there are many things he wants to do now that he no longer has to work for a living. The major benefit is that I can concentrate on what I want to do without worrying about money. Most people have long believed working is necessary to earn a living. Horie thinks that basic income will change the concept of work. The usual definition of work will change, that's all. People think it's impossible to live just doing what they want to do without working, but that's not true at all. Hmm, Shirotaka, I thought we worked to earn a living. Um, do we have to change that view? In fact, the idea of a basic income is said to have first appeared in the book Utopia by the 16th century philosopher Thomas More. Centuries later, the idea is back in the limelight. The concept of a universal basic income may force us to squarely face fundamental questions such as uh, why we work and how, wh how wealth should be distributed in societies where often the rich become richer and the poor become poorer. Thank you, Hirotaka.
final round of voting in Nepal's parliamentary election has just finished. About 12 million people in the southern part of the country, including the capital, cast their ballots. Taradara Kalsan in Bangkok has the details. After a decade-long civil war and political instability, people in Nepal have high hopes for their first election under a new constitution that was adopted two years ago. The first phase of the election was held late last month and involved the northern parts of the country. With the proclamation of a new constitution, this is a very exciting vote and a historic moment for the people. 275 members of the federal parliament will be selected in the election. Voters will also choose the members of seven provincial assemblies the new constitution has set up. I am here to vote in this first election for provinces in the hope that the provincial government will deliver results. Observers say the election results could affect the country's diplomacy. The current ruling party, the Nepali Congress, is seen to be pro-India. But the left alliance led by former Maoist rebels and the opposition communist UML party leans towards China. Vote counting starts Thursday evening. The results will be announced in two weeks. The Australian Parliament passed a same-sex marriage bill with a clear majority on Thursday in its last session of the year. The law will go into force soon after the Governor-General signs the bill. The result of the vote was read out in the House of Representatives to loud applause. Only four lawmakers voted against it. Some politicians displayed rainbow flags, a symbol of the sexual minorities movement. What a day for love, for equality, for respect. Australia has done it. Every Australian had their say and they said it's fair. Get on with it. And the parliament has got on with it. And we have voted today for equality, for love. Gay marriage supporters came to the parliament building to witness the historic moment. I know it's, a, it's an overwhelming moment. I'm, I'm so proud of Australia. I'm so proud of my parliament today. A former Olympic swimming champion and marriage equality ambassador also celebrated the day. Today I am proud to call myself an Australian as much as, as, much as I have any other day of my life. I realise what this means for young LGBTIQ people right across the country. The Pew Research Center in the United States says Australia is the 24th country to legalize same-sex marriage. Australians will see its first legally married gay couples next month because state governments require a one-month notice period before marriage. Increased narcotics production is one of the major problems facing Afghanistan. But the country's government demonstrated its stance on tackling the issue by staging a huge bonfire of opium and other illegal drugs. Afghan drug control officials on Wednesday invited the media to a field near Kabul to watch the incineration of an entire ton of drugs confiscated during the past year, including opium and heroin. A U.N. report in November estimates that the country's opium production has increased 87 percent from a year earlier, topping the 9,000-ton mark. Afghanistan will strengthen anti-drug measures next year in coordination with the international community and its troops stationed in this country. Opium farming is spreading particularly in the south, far from the government's eye, where the Taliban's influence remains strong. Authorities believe the Taliban is taking a cut from poppy growers to use for military purposes. The UN is concerned that Afghanistan's worsening security situation could foster insurgencies. Low-income people in Asia's developing countries have found help in the form of microfinance, or the practice of lending small amounts of money to help businesses get started. A program in Pakistan helps women become economically independent. NHK World's Tahir Ali reports. 
Sumaira runs this beauty parlor in a suburb of Islamabad. She didn't have enough money to buy quality cosmetics and equipment, so she took out a loan for less than $700. That allowed her to buy materials and decorate the space. Today she says she wouldn't have her business if it weren't for the microfinance service. When I got started, I could only afford cheap cosmetics, but with the microloan I could buy quality products. My shop has a good reputation and is attracting more customers. Sumera got her loan from a bank in Pakistan that specializes in microfinance. The bank lends up to $1,400 and borrowers have 18 months to repay. For the past five years, one of the bank's investors has been the Japan International Cooperation Agency or JICA. The agency aims to help women become economically self-sufficient. More than 200,000 people used microfinance services in Pakistan last year. One of them is Shehnaz Bibi who says microfinance allowed her to expand her business. By borrowing money, I can make and sell clothes. Bibi says women who want to start a business face many challenges, such as securing funding. Pakistani women face strong opposition to working outside their families, and so social advancement for them has been slow. We want to help women stand on their own feet economically by creating jobs and improving living conditions. Women account for 30% of microfinance borrowers. Around half of Pakistan's adult population lacks access to financial services, but they find help in microfinance programs, which is one key to raise themselves out of poverty. Tahir Ali, NHK World, Islamabad. And that wraps up our bulletin. I'm Tra Tirakosan in Bangkok. A survivor of the 1945 atomic bombing of Hiroshima is in Oslo to attend the Nobel Peace Prize award ceremony. This year's prize went to the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, known as ICANN, for its efforts leading to the adoption of a landmark UN treaty to ban nuclear arms. Francesco Thorlo has been advocating for that for years. Her efforts are believed to have contributed to the adoption of the treaty. The 85-year-old woman now lives in Canada. ICANN says she'll be the first atomic bomb survivor to deliver a speech at the ceremony. The UN adopted a treaty in July virtually banning nuclear weapons. But nuclear powers like the US, Russia and China have not signed on. Neither have countries that rely on the US nuclear umbrella for protection, including Japan. An American team says it has found five sunken Japanese warships near the Philippines dating back to World War II. So this here is uh, Yamashiro. Uh, and we've got down here, we've got Fuso. It's kind of an overview of the first project. The team says the vessels were found off the coast of the southwestern part of the Philippines. It's believed the team found two battleships, the Yamashiro and the Fuso, and three destroyers from the now defunct Japanese Imperial Navy. The U.S. attacked the ships during a battle in October of 1944. The team was led by Paul Allen, who is the co-founder of IT giant Microsoft. They say they'll post photos of the ships on their Facebook page. The team also found the sunken wreckage of the USS Ward, which reportedly fired the first American shots of World War II. The same team attracted global attention two years ago after discovering another well-known Japanese battleship off the Philippines. It's time for World Weather with our meteorologist, Jonathan O. Hello, Jonathan. Hello. So we did have a chilly day in Tokyo mm -hmm. today, but as long as you were walking under the sun, it felt warm. Yeah, um, wow. So the weekend is coming up. What is it looking like? 
Um, not so sunny, unfortunately. Oh, At least no. part of it, I know. I know you're like, it's sunny, it's nice outside, it's gonna be nice for the weekend. I'm going like, no. Oh. Unfortunately, we're looking at rain for at least part of it in Tokyo as we are seeing a system moving through late Friday into Saturday morning. I think we'll be dealing with a little bit of wet weather, but it's not gonna be all weekend, right? It's just going to be a period of time late Friday into Saturday where we're seeing the chance for some wet weather. And what's happening is a low pressure system with a lot of rain and and snow with it is crossing over the northern areas of Japan. So that is bringing chilly weather up toward the north and wet weather down toward the south. And with a high pressure system south of Japan, uh, simply put, we have warm air coming in from the south and cold air coming in from the north. And when those two run in together, we tend to have a little bit of activity. So we will be seeing some wet weather, especially for late Friday in Tokyo. And then eventually we'll go into Saturday morning and we'll see that chance for some rain as well. And then hopefully we'll start to dry out after that, though we'll still see the clouds from time to time. Showers into Osaka and Fukuoka and plenty of snow. Cold weather will continue. Some places in Hokkaido saw temperatures falling 20 degrees below zero. If that's not cold for you, I don't know what would be. That's chilly. Uh, we're looking at dry weather back toward the west, but cold air also gripping uh, the continental areas of East Asia, freezing over in the capital, South Korea. Six in Beijing, 12 degrees below zero in Ulaanbaatar, and eight in Shanghai as we go through Friday. Now, we are going to turn to something a lot more serious when it comes to the situation in Southern California. We have m at least four major fires taking place near Los Angeles. Here's a look at the video. People here are complaining. Residents are saying, look, we're just dealing with all of the smoke that's coming from these significant fires. The Thomas Fire, located in Ventura County, northwest of Los Angeles, uh, 27,000 residents evacuated because of this. At least 150 structures burned, and in the process, one person has died because of that fire. We're also talking about a few other ones as well. Take a look at this map. This is a satellite view from space, from NASA, pictures. And if you notice from the Thomas Fire in Ventura County, this is smoke, all of it, that's moving out toward the Pacific Ocean. That's how serious and how large this fire is. In fact, there are some pictures with people driving down Highway 405 right through Los Angeles, and they're literally flames that are jumping over the overpass because of the winds that are pushing through the area. And also to uh, San Bernardino County, northeast of Los Angeles, just as serious. Santa Ana winds will continue to blow through the area with high wind warning and red flag warnings in place. Extreme fire danger weather, please. Uh, be careful with this situation as we go forward through the next few days. That's a look at your forecast. Hope you have a good day wherever you are. And once again, the headlines. Donald Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital has provoked criticism and protests across the Islamic world. A senior UN official has met with North Korea's foreign minister in Pyongyang. Japanese fishermen are dealing with an influx of North Koreans fishing illegally in the Sea of Japan. Trade ministers are preparing to resume negotiations at the WTO. The conference chair tells us why the organization is still needed. And that's it for today's Newsroom Tokyo. I'm Hideki Nakayama. And I'm Aki Shibuya. Coming up next, NHK World's interview program, The Red Talk. Stay with us.